Hi, everybody. My name is Dal Santariga, and this is my paranormal experience. In uh, 1989, I was hired to, uh, to work for the New York United States Postal Service in Yonkers, New York. Um, part of my training was to go out with different carriers during the day and learn different routes. Uh, country routes are different compared to business routes. Business routes are different compared to apartment buildings and vice versa and all of that stuff. And uh, I was asked to hold down a route one day. The carrier had called out sick and I didn't have a lot of experience at this point. And uh, they asked me to hold down the route. And I went out and I did this one particular route. We'll call it Route 28 or whatever. And I noticed when I got to this one street, that all the houses on the east side of the street were even and all the houses on the west side of the street were odd, except for this one huge building, which had an even number to it, which didn't sit right for me, just didn't ring true to me why this particular building had an even number when the even number was uh, the houses were on the other side of the street. So when I got back to the post office, I asked a few guys and, not, you know, no one really wanted to talk about it. And then the following day, the boss put me out with a senior guy. His name was Paul. We'll call him Paul. And um, we were doing biz, uh, building routes that day. And he had um, probably 20 giant buildings that he were doing. And he was showing me how, you know, the buildings, how you do the buildings with the, with the, with the mail and the packages and all of that stuff. And, after a couple of days of working with Paul, he opened up to me and he started to tell me this one particular story about his friend, Joe. Apparently, Joe had a route on uh, North Yonkers and uh, North Yonkers is notorious for devil worshipping. There's a park in North Yonkers called Untermeyer's Park. You can Google it. It'll tell you the history of the park and all the devil worshipping that went on there. And uh, Joe was doing this. Joe was doing his route one day. He had been on his route for a, a bunch of years. And uh, so we were, he was telling me that um, one Halloween, Joe went downstairs into the garage. There's a bathroom down to the garage. It's, it's actually used for, as the pool bathroom, there's a pool, a uh, big like uh, Olympic swimming pool in the back of the building. And they have all kinds of barbecues and stuff going on. And the people at the pool use this particular bathroom in the garage. And Joe had to use this bathroom. It was Halloween and no one was around. The doorman wasn't around and the super of the building wasn't around. And he didn't want to drive back to the post office to use the bathroom. And so he went downstairs to the bathroom. And while he was using the bathroom, doing his business, he started to smell smoke. And he thought maybe that there was a car in the garage that had caught on fire or something. So when he opened up the door to the bathroom to leave, he seen six tall figures in hooded hoods um, standing around a pentagram burning, billowing up black smoke. And he couldn't believe what his eyes were seeing. Yeah. As this black smoke was billowing up out of this out, out of this fire a gray smoke came out and the gray smoke turned into some kind of demon or devil or something to that effect and it seen joe standing by the bathroom door and it made a beeline towards him and it told him for what he's seen there that day it would have his soul of course, Joe freaked out and went back to the post office and he said he would never do that building ever again. Now, this particular building, I come to find out later on, was the Santa, Son of Sam building, the David Berkowitz building. OK, and uh, so, you know, that that was that was pretty interesting when I found that out on later on. But anyway, Paul goes on to tell me that. Joe says he wasn't going to do that route anymore. And uh, as a matter of fact, he was so distraught from what he experienced in that garage that he asked for a leave of absence. And he got, took a leave of absence. And while he was out on a leave of absence, his life 
just went to hell in a handbasket. His he became an alcoholic. His wife threw him out of the house. He lost his she divorced him. He lost the privilege to see his kids. He lost his home. Everything was just his life was crumbling around him because of what he seen in that garage that particular day. Paul had taken him in. He was living with Paul. And uh, uh, the way Yonkers, the post office works, Yonkers is a big city. It's it's the lar- third largest city in, in New York State. And it had five different post offices. And a bid came up for the post office in Central Yonkers. And Joe bid on it. And he got the bid. And this particular route was a really, really nice country route. And Joe got an apartment on the route. And, you know, he, he was so familiar with everybody in the neighborhood. He became like the mayor of that of that route. And everybody knew him. And his life started to turn around again. And he stopped drinking. And him and his wife were talking about getting back together and all of this stuff. And, and Paul is telling me the story. And I'm taking it with a grain of salt because I'm not sure if Paul is pulling my chain because I'm a newbie, you know, and he's a senior guy. But I'm like, I'm thinking, okay, what Paul doesn't know is that my brother-in-law works at that central post office. So when I get home, I'm going to call my brother-in-law to validate everything he's telling me. So Paul goes on to tell me that after about a year on that route, um, there was a dead end street that only had about five houses on the end of the route. And at the end of this street was like a little grassy knoll that the, the, the kids in the neighborhood were playing. In. It was like a, almost like a little uh, neighborhood park, but it was just really a grassy knoll with a big oak tree in the middle of it. At some point, a black cat shows up on Joe's route at this, at this particular street at the end of the route every day. And Joe stops delivering the mail to this one particular house at the end of the block because the cat, this black cat is attacking him. Joe sprays the cat with the dog spray, but it has no effect on the cat. So Joe starts holding the mail, holding the mail, holding the mail. And um, at some point, the cat started talking to Joe telepathically that Joe, at the end of the summer, when the summer would end, that the devil would have Joe's soul, which brought back flashbacks of what happened to him in that garage, you know, the year before. So Joe's holding the mail. He's freaking out. The people call the post office. They want to know why they're not getting the mail. Um, the supervisor says, um, let me check. He checks under Joe's desk and all the mail is in the tub there. And he says, yeah, we have your mail here. And so I'll talk to the carrier and find out why it's not being delivered. Now, in the meantime, my brother-in-law was Joe's floater. He was the guy who did the route when Joe was off. So when my brother-in-law came back into the building, the supervisor asked him, do you have an issue delivering this one particular house on this street? And he says, nope, never have an issue. I deliver it. You know, whenever I'm on the route, I deliver it. It's okay. So then Joe comes in. And he asks Joe what's going on. And Joe says, well, they have a cat. And this cat attacks me every time I'm there. And I'm not, and the dog spray doesn't do anything to it. I'm not dealing with this cat. You know, at this point, Joe's not telling the supervisor or anybody at the post office that the cat has began talking to him telepathically and telling him that it's going to take his soul. But he's explaining why he's holding the mail back. So now the truck driver will call him John. He rolls in and uh, the supervisor says, hey, John, when you're delivering packages to this one particular house, do you ever have an issue with, with, a, with ca- any animals? And John says, I've been delivering packages there for 15 years. I've never had an issue with any animals on that block. I've never seen any dogs or cats or anything on that block. I deliver the packages when I go down there. So the supervisor, you know, he goes out that Saturday. He takes the mail out to these people. He promised them he would deliver their mail. He takes the mail out to them and he says, listen, you know, um, the reason why Joe is not delivering your mail is because you have this cat that attacks him, you know, and you have to keep the cat in the house until after Joe leaves, you know. And 
the people who lived in the apartment that in the, in the home said looked at him like he had two heads like what are you talking about we don't own any animals we don't have a dog we don't have a cat we don't have anything if there's a cat out here attacking joe it's a feral cat it's not ours so nobody nobody really knows what's going on like you know is joe you know delusional or what what's going on and then the end of the summer rolls around the end of, now this is what paul's telling me. the end of the summer rolls around and um joe never comes back to the station so uh, when the truck driver comes in the truck drivers are usually the last guys to get in the building at the end of the day they ask they ask johnny did you see joe out there on the route and he said um I didn't see him, but I seen his car out there. I know he's out there, you know? And he said, well, could you do me a favor and go out there and get Joe, bring him back. I want to punch out. I want to go home. This is a long weekend. I want to get out of here. So John says, absolutely. No problem. John jumps back in his truck. He drives back out to the route. He goes right to that last street because that's where you, the, the boss told him, start at the last street and work your way to the front. He gets to the last street and pulls down that road. And Joe is hanging from his mailbag from this giant oak tree in the grassy knoll. So John goes to the local deli and he calls the police and then he calls the post office and he tells them what happened and the cops come and the police and the supervisors come and the firemen, the fire department comes because they got to take him out. He's so high up on the tree they needed the, the ladder to get him out and off and, uh, just crazy story and um like i said i'm not sure if P paul is pulling my chain or not but when i get home that night i call my brother who literally lived around the corner from me and i said hey man i just heard this crazy story is there any truth to the rumor and my brother says absolutely um i was i was joe's floater i did the route when i was when he was off i was actually he actually my brother actually got the route after joe passed and he said and i said um who who was the truck driver that found joe you know so oh, john found joe john was the guy who found joe hanging from the tree so i hear this story and it's just like wow this is crazy um and i know joe seen this in one of the buildings in north yonkers and the the route 28 was really a very high end route. The buildings were all professional people. The homes were nice family homes. It was a Polish community. Um, really, really a nice area. You, you would, you would really, you, know, you would want that route if you had the opportunity to get it. My boss comes to me, not knowing that Paul had told me the story about the building. And then uh, I find out that that particular building is the David Berkowitz's building, and they had to change the number from 35 to 42 because there were too many people coming by, blocking up the road, taking pictures of the building because that's where David Berkowitz's son of Sam lived, and they just wanted to alleviate that traffic, that congestion. <clears throat> so the boss says, um, I want you to hold down the route. This uh, The regular guy got hurt, injured his back. He's going to be out for like a year would you would you hold it down and i said absolutely i'll hold that route down that's a beautiful route i'll have no problem doing that route you know and i'm getting it now um in the spring the spring is just sprung i'm getting it now and so i'm there in spring and, and he says to me whatever you do please don't use the bathroom in the garage i don't care if you have to come back to the post office, I'll authorize the overtime. I don't want you going down in that garage for no reason. So I was like, fine, I won't go down in the garage. He doesn't know that I know the story, but I know, I know what happened to Joe, and I know what he's seen down there, and I have no desire to go down in that garage or use that bathroom. I become very friendly with the with the doorman and he's got a bathroom in his office. I become very friendly with the super and he let me use the bathroom in his apartment. And um, at one point in time, I actually asked the super to show me David Berkowitz's apartment because, you know, I'm in this building every single day. 
and this is a high end building. I, I'd want, I'm dying to see, it, you know? And so he says, I'll take you up. We don't rent that apartment out anymore, but I'll take you up to the apartment, but I'm not going down the hall. I'll give you the key to go in. I'm staying by the elevator. So I said, fine, let's, let's do it. So one day, he takes me up and David lives on like the fifth floor, fourth or fifth floor, something like that. And as we're going up in the elevator, it's fine until you get to about the third floor. And then you begin to feel like a heaviness and you get to the fourth floor and it's getting heavier. And by the time we get to the fifth floor and the elevator doors go to open, I felt like the devil himself was going to be standing there waiting for me. So the elevator door is open. We both step out. The, the super steps to the right, gives me the key. I walk down this long hallway. I go to Dipper, go to the apartment. I open the door. I walk in. There's a kitchen to the left. There's a bathroom to the right. Directly in front of me is this, it's his living room. To the left of that is his bedroom. Both the living room and the bedroom overlook the back yard where the the Olympic sized pool was where they had the barbecues, but it also overlooked the, the houses on the other side of the street of the pool, which was Sam's house. Sam was a retired Yonkers cop who lived there and had a German shepherd and the German shepherd, as a matter of fact, everybody who lived on that side of the street, all their mailboxes were up at the, by the front, by the gates because the houses were actually built in the woods. And um, everybody had a dog. And whenever you walked up to each individual mailbox to put the mail in, the dog would dogs would come charging up to the gate. It didn't matter what kind of dog it was. They would always come charging up. So David Berkowitz was having this telepathic communication with Sam, this German shepherd, who told him to do what he did. So I'm walking around this apartment, and I'm thinking, it is so heavy. I don't claim to be psychic by any stretch of imagination, but I am sensitive in ways and I can feel this heaviness. And I'm thinking to myself, how are the people next door on either side of him or above him and below him living in this building and not feel this heaviness? You have to feel this heaviness. If you live there, you have to feel this heaviness. So I come downstairs and I, I tell, I thank the super for letting me do that. It was pretty interesting. Time goes on, delivering the mail. Now this is a, like I said, this is a high end building. They decorate this building for every holiday under the sun. They got a community room that's always decked out for every holiday. Halloween rolls around. The doorman's not there that day, or at least he's not at his station. I don't know where he is. Um, the super is nowhere to be found. I have all the mailboxes open with each bag of mail in front of it. And this building had six, six large boxes with six full bags of mail in front of it. And I have to use the bathroom. And I say to myself, okay. Let me go knock on the super store. I knock on the super store. There's no answer. The doorman, like I said, is nowhere to be found. I don't know if he's on lunch. I don't know where he is. Now I'm thinking, do I use the bathroom downstairs or do I put all this mail back in my car and drive to the post office? Now, as time went on that summer, I spent a lot of time going down into the pool area to deliver packages and accountable mail to the people that especially the, like the school teachers or the women that were home the kids were in the pool and the doorman didn't want to take it because they were downstairs they could go and they could sign for their own package so i spent a lot of time going down through this garage out to that pool sitting with people talking with people getting signatures dropping off packages and they were very good to me the people in this building were very good to me they offered me hot dogs and hamburgers and ice creams and soda, even offered to let me use the pool if I wanted to. And I was like, no, I don't think it would be a good idea if my boss came by and see me in the pool. But um, that Halloween, I noticed that the building wasn't decorated. And it didn't make any sense to me because this building had a ton of kids in it. 
This is a large building. It had a south side and a north side. It was like two buildings combined into one. And it didn't make any sense that they didn't celebrate Halloween when they celebrated everything else. Anyway, I say, you know what? I've used the bathroom a million times downstairs all year long. I've never had a problem. Today is just another day. I'm going to go use the bathroom downstairs. So I go down in the basement and I use the bathroom. And as I'm doing my business, I begin to hear chanting. And this is not a good sign. I hear it chanting and I, and I hear a voice in my head say, this is not good. Then I start to smell smoke. And I, so I crack open the door just like an eighth of an inch just to peek out to see what's out there. And I see six people in hooded robes chanting around a pentagram that's on fire and it's black billowing smoke is rising up in the ceiling of the garage. I gently close the door. I lock it. I sit my, I sit on the floor with my back to the door and I just, I'm as quiet as a mouse and I don't say nothing. I never hear the people who are doing the chanting leave. They didn't leave via the garage door because I would have heard the garage door open. They didn't leave via the elevator because the elevator, I would have heard ding because it was right next to the entrance. The only way they could have left that garage was through the stairwells. And that's what I think they did. I think they did what they did and conjured what they conjured on Halloween. And then after whatever they conjured, they all went back to their apartments. Now, I'm sitting on the floor in the dark against this door for like an hour and a half. When the doorman and the super come down, because they see all the mail in front of the mailboxes, they know I'm in the building, but they don't know where I am. So they come down and knock on the door and they said, hey, Al, are you in there? And I was like, yeah. And they said, okay, don't worry. We'll take the door off the hinges. We'll let you out. And I was like, no, the door's not stuck. I can get out. Let me explain to you what I've just seen. And I tell them, and they're like, no, no, there's there, that that couldn't have possible and have happened. And I said, come with me. And I brought them over to the to the area where the fire was actually lit on the ground. And I said, look on the ceiling of this. And it was all filled with black soot from the fire itself. And when the super seen that, he was like, okay. I got to clean this before these people come home because these people will go nuts if they see this black soot on the, on the garage ceiling. Now you, like I said, this is a high end building. There are executives in there. There are lawyers in there. There are doctors, school teachers, all nurses, all kinds of educated people in this building. I don't know what these people were doing with the people who were the devil worshipers in the park. But I believe it's just one man's opinion that the people in the building were actually running the show and the people in the park were just their minions that were doing the dirty deeds that they were doing. At the end of that block, there was a nice little old Polish woman who lived at the end of the block and her mailboxes were down by her driveway, but she had about 30 steps that went up to her first floor. And what I used to do was I used to bring the mail up there and rubber band it, put it between her storm doors. So she wouldn't have to make those steps because she was elderly. She was about 80 years old at the time. And we became friends. And she, during the summer, she'd have iced tea and lemonade for me. And in the winter, hot chocolate or coffee, you know, maybe a piece of cake every now and then. And we got to talk in that particular day. And I told her what I seen. And she said, let me tell you what happened here in my house. And I said, what happened here in your house? She said, you had a beautiful basement apartment that a young Polish couple had um, rented. And apparently the husband of the young woman got involved with the devil worshipers in the park. Now, Everybody from Yonkers, and it doesn't matter what side of Yonkers you're from, I'm from the south side. 
knows about North Yonkers and the devil worshippers. This particular park that they that they practice their their conjuring in is called Unter Myers Park. They used to have all kinds of concerts up there, battles of the bands. We were always up there with our, with our band or with our friends' bands, and we were always up there doing stuff. You know what I mean? Everybody knew that when it got night out, it got dark, you left that park because the devil worship was were coming out. My brother, who worked at the hospital that was adjacent to the park, he was uh, an IT guy at the time. He had uh, he was working the night shift, and he had an office up on the top floor. And he used to tell me about the bonfires he would see in the back of the park where the devil worshippers were practicing their conjuring. The cops knew about it. The cops knew about it. They didn't want nothing to do with them. The cops just said, leave them alone. And so this woman goes on to tell me that at one point, the young couple, the lady, the woman got pregnant and had a baby. And these devil worshippers came from the park to get this woman's baby. And while they were in the apartment, they were doing some kind of conjuring or whatever. And they were trying to take the baby. God only knows why they wanted her baby. But she wouldn't give the baby up. And she was fighting with them. And the old lady heard the commotion. She called the cops. The cops arrested everybody and took everybody away. And the young woman took the baby and moved away. After they left that apartment, the old lady would go on to tell me that every single night after she locked everything up, made sure all the lights were out and everything, she would go upstairs. She would hear the water running in the sink, the water running in the shower, and all the lights would be on in the apartment. And she would go back downstairs, shut everything off. And by the time she got up to her, her apartment on the first floor, everything was back on. And she couldn't rent that apartment to anybody. Everybody she brought in to rent that apartment could feel the evil that was in that apartment. Nobody wanted to live there. One summer, a Polish priest came over from Poland um, to, to worship at their church, at their community church. And she got him to come in and do a cleansing of the apartment. And after he cleansed and he told her, that there was something very dark, very strong and powerful in her apartment. And after he cleansed that apartment, and according to her, it took him like a week. He had to come back every single day. After, after he, he cleansed that apartment, there was, she never had any more issues with that apartment. So as so I'm hearing all this stuff and I'm, I'm living this experience and I'm like, going through deja vu because this is exactly what happened to Joe. But thank God I didn't see any gray smoke and nothing came over to the bathroom to approach me. A few years later, my in-laws ended up buying a condominium across from the park. So my wife and I went to, actually my wife, we were still dating at the time. I went to pick her up one day and we went to the park to have a picnic. Because it's a beautiful park. It really is. During the day, it's a beautiful park. At night, it's a whole different feeling. So we go to the park and we have a beautiful, it's a beautiful sunny day, summertime, nice breeze. We're, we're having a picnic, we're, you know, and we're eating and we're drinking. And my wife says to me, do you know where the caves are in the woods in the park? And I was like, yeah, I know where the caves are because, you know, I had a cousin who lived in North Yonkers, and whenever we went to visit him, we would go to those woods and, and hang out. And we'd search for those caves, and we found them, you know. And she goes, show me the caves. So I was like, okay. So as we start walking across this large field that they used to have the concerts in, it was like the size of a football field. Um, as we're walking across it, there's a stairwell in the back of the park. It's called the Thousand Steps. And it goes from the top of the park all the way down to the next street below. Um, I think it's a playoff of the Spanish Steps in Rome, to be honest with you. But they call it the Thousand Steps. And as we're getting towards the, the, these Thousand Steps, the clouds are rolling in. 
and it's getting windy and it's getting dark. And we both look at each other like, can you believe how bad the weather has changed in the two minutes it took us to cross the field? And as we start to go down, now there is a, a path that runs in the middle of the Spanish steppes. It's called the aqueduct. They actually run water from the Catskill mountain range under the ground through this aqueduct to New York City for the, for the people in the city. And as we're walking down these thousand steps, we hear a whoosh go over our heads. Like an eagle had just came down at us. We both duck. We both look up. There's nothing in the sky around us. But on the aqueduct, 100, maybe 200, 150 feet away from us at this point, we're both staring to the right side of the aqueduct, like something is standing there. And my wife looks, she's looking there, and I'm looking there, and my wife is sensitive as well. And she's looking there, and I'm looking there, and we both look at each other, and she goes, you know what? Forget about the caves today. And I said, you know what? They have a thing at the other side of the park. It's called the Eagle's Nest. It's a, it looks like a giant bird cage and they call it the, they, oh, they call it the bird cage or whatever the, the Eagle's Nest. I don't remember, but it looks like a giant bird cage. And, um, I said, I'll show you the giant bird cage or the Eagle's Nest. I forgot what I called it at the time. And right below it is like a grotto where they would have like Shakespeare in the park. So they, it was like a clamshell kind of thing. And I said, I'll show you those two things. It's very, very cool, you know? So as we're walking back on the park department's paved road, they have a paved road that they drive on to pick up all the garbage cleans to clean up after the park closes. We're walking back. We're walking south towards the bird's nest or the, or the eagle or the bird cage. And I'm really excited to show her because she's never seen these things and they're very, very cool looking, you know? And as we're walking there, we hear a whoosh go over our heads again. And again, we both duck like something just came down at us and we both stop dead in our tracks and we look at each other. And directly in front of us is a large oak tree with a branch that's got to be 100 feet high that comes out over the road that we're on. And this branch is just there. And we're both looking up at this particular branch. Neither one of us are moving. Neither one of us are talking. We're just looking at this branch. And then she looks at me. And she says, what do you see up there? And I look at her and I says, what do you see up there? And she says, um, I don't know if you're familiar with this old movie called The Gargoyles. It was a 70s TV movie. And in it, the leader of the Gargoyles looked like the devil himself with horns and wings. She goes, I'm seeing the leader of the Gargoyles up there. now." My wife is a few years younger than me. I never expected her to even know about this movie, The Gargoyles, because it was a 70s movie. And I love that movie. You know, I've watched it a million times and I couldn't believe that she was seeing the same exact thing that I was seeing. I was seeing the gargoyle himself up there or this entity that looked like the devil himself with horns and wings. We both looked at each other and said, maybe it's time for us to leave. We left that park that day, and it's been 35 years. We've never been back in that park ever again. And uh, that's my paranormal experience with the uh, Son of Sam building and onto Myers Park and the devil worshipers that conjured stuff in it. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed the experience. If you've had a paranormal experience and would like to be a guest on the show, please contact us by going to myparax.com. That's myparax.com. 
www.thinkingdeeply.com. Thanks for listening.